It's 30 years since the Viking probe landed upon Mars. Uh, tonight we're going to concentrate upon Mars. But first of all, our news notes. In 31, the nearest star, apart from the sun of course, 4.2 light years away. It's a companion of the bright southern double star, Alpha Centauri. But is Proxima really a companion at all? We've always thought so, going around the main pair, but there's a suggestion now that it may merely be passing by. And these are results from the Hipparchus satellite that gave us the most detailed picture map of our local neighbourhood, creating a map which scientists are still analysing. And then at much nearer home, Venus. Venus Express. Amazing pictures of the polar vortex on Venus. Yes, not just pictures, but movies as well. And this is the beginning of a huge wealth of information about Venus's atmosphere. Look at the South Pole, for example. There's a hurricane here, a vortex, but it doesn't just have one eye, it's got two, and you can clearly see them in these images. A dense atmosphere made up chiefly of carbon dioxide. No landing there, I'm afraid. No, the pressure's immense, and in fact, the atmosphere extends much further out than we thought it did. This is one of the results that's already come from Venus Express, we know on the night side at least the thick atmosphere extends up to 90 kilometres and even a tenuous atmosphere well up to above 100 kilometres, much thicker than anyone imagined. And clouds, which is sulfuric acid. They're not a very welcoming kind of world up here. No, and through a telescope, of course, you just see a brilliant disk because the clouds reflect the light. But Venus Express can use ultraviolet to see all kinds of changing detail in the cloud tops. Look at these ultraviolet images, for example. There are dark regions, and it's those regions of the atmosphere that are absorbing most of the sunlight. That's how Venus gets its heat. Well, now, let's go beyond the solar system. This is, this is your problem, this course. Yes, two big surveys to talk about today. When we were in Hawaii a few months ago, we saw the beginnings of the United Kingdom Digital Sky Survey yes. on, on Newkirk, the infrared telescope there, with their fantastic new camera, WIFCAM. And the first results are out. And this is interesting because the survey does two jobs. It discovers distant things. This galaxy we see as it was more than 12 billion years ago. The lights travelled from the early parts of the universe to us here today, that small red dot. We're getting somewhere near the edge of the observable universe. Yes, well this is back to when the universe was very young. But it's not just distant galaxies. We can also look at some of the most nearby objects. Brown dwarfs, the smallest of all stars. Now, about a hundred or so of these are already known, but what we don't know is whether they're relatively common or whether they're a rarity. Well, they're such low luminosity thing, we can only see them if they're fairly local. But this infrared survey will tell us, and these are some of the first candidate objects. Uh, we haven't done the follow-up yet, you need to go and look at them with different telescopes, but this is the beginnings of what should be a bumper crop of, of brown dwarfs. A major infrared survey, and now another one being planned at the Rutherford Apple Laboratory, and Chris went there to find out more about it. Some regions of the infrared are still accessible from the ground, and the new VISTA telescope is designed to survey the entire sky. I saw it when I was in Chile in November 2004, when construction was just beginning. The camera is now nearly ready to be sent out to Chile in preparation for first light. It's in the room behind me, but unfortunately it's in pieces, and that means that I need to be very careful about contaminating it. Even the smallest particle of dust will glow in the infrared and interfere with the optics. So, we'll keep the camera clean, but let's go and have a look. Scientists from institutions all over the UK have worked together to create the VISTA camera. It's being assembled here at RAL, and it's a novel departure for a laboratory which normally produces satellites, which have to be both small and light. This camera, though, is the size and weight of an adult Indian elephant. Once it joins the other telescopes of the European Southern Observatory, it will provide access to the dark and dusty regions of the universe, which glow in the infrared. Those regions contain stars which are forming, and the first glimpse of them will come in this region of the spectrum. The heart of VISTA is its camera, with more infrared pixels than have ever been turned towards the sky before. I can't get any closer than this, because it has to be in a super clean environment. But there it is, and it's ready to be mounted on the rest of the camera. The camera is in its final stages of assembly. Behind me, you can see the tube that's an array of very special baffles. And what they do, they absorb any scattered light or radiation that might be inside the camera that is going to upset the measurements made by the infrared detectors. At the heart of the camera is an array of 16 2K by 2K, that's 2024 by 2024 pixel detectors. I guess it's 67 million pixels looking at the sky for this survey. 
The camera is unusual in that it's quite wide field of view. It's 1.65 degrees field of view, which means that um, we're looking at a wider swath of sky than, than anything equivalent. Vista will see first light early next year, and the results from the survey should be spectacular. We await results. And now, on to our main program, ExoMars. I'm casting my mind back 30 years to that program we did when Viking 1 touched down gently on the surface of Mars. Seems a long time ago. The other Mars probes since then. And now, a new one's being planned, ExoMars. And uh, Chris went to a sand quarry to have a look at a mock-up of it. It's just a sandy quarry in Bedfordshire, but for today, this is the surface of another planet. And this rover, Bridget, is the prototype for ExoMars. It's designed to navigate difficult and rocky terrain, just like this. ExoMars is the most ambitious and expensive planetary mission that the European Space Agency has ever undertaken, and it's due for launch in 2011. The main mission will be carried out by the rover itself, but some of the instruments will stay behind on what's known as the geophysical package. These static instruments will be long-lived and should provide a view of conditions at one site for up to two Martian years. And remember, a Martian year is just less than two Earth years. Meanwhile, the rover will be free to explore, travelling at speeds of up to 100 metres an hour. That may not seem much, but it's a new speed record for the Martian surface. Well, that's the rover moving at top speed. Why don't you take us for a tour? We have a, a mast which will have cameras. You can see a stereo pair there, and they're on a pan and tilt mechanism. There will also be some instrumentation on the final rover there. But also down here we have an instrument arm which will have a suite of instruments on the end of it. And the purpose of that will be to have contact instruments which are able to be extended and touch rocks and so on. We have the non-contact instruments and these will be um, in the mast head. And also there will be some analytical instruments inside the rover body. There will also be a drill on the front here to pick up samples from below the surface down to a depth of two metres. And that's never been done before on Mars. No one's dug that deep before. That's right. This is uh, something that's unique for the ExoMars programme. So it'll be a mixture of different instruments, but most of them will be at the front of the rover. And there is a reason for that. Um, we have um, a requirement to make sure that all of the samples stay at a, a certain temperature between minus 10 and minus 30 degrees. And that's to preserve, uh, the, if you like, the internal structure of the material, which may contain water. Mm -hmm. Of course, as you, as you heat up the, the you uh, samples... the water. Exactly. So we're going to have a cold end of the rover, which will be the front part, and then the warmer end, where all the constantly running electronics and the thermal control system that we use to keep it warm, they'll be placed at the back there. And the battery will also be there where it needs to be. And this is fairly easy going, of course, but the rover is designed to cope with much rougher terrain. It is. It'll handle a step height of up to 30 centimetres, so it'll be able to go over some fairly big rocks, and it does climb very well. We know on Mars you can have anything from bedrock through to, well, some sand dunes. Absolutely. The current missions for uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers run by NASA have demonstrated quite clearly that the conditions vary an awful lot, and the rover needs to be able to cope with all of those without getting stuck or without going over the edge of a cliff or whatever. So it's very, very important that we make sure that we establish uh, a good performance on the rover to make sure that we can deliver our instruments uh, to the spot where they need to be. I joked about it at the beginning, but this is actually very fast for a this rover. This is fast for a Mars rover, yes. This one will actually do 150 metres per hour, which may not seem very fast, but um, the current MER rovers travel about half that speed. The biggest problem for the rover's designers is the need for the machine to act autonomously. The time taken for signals to travel between Earth and Mars makes it impractical to control the rover directly, and so it needs to have the capability on board to both make decisions and to navigate, and also to decide which obstacles are just too dangerous for it to attempt. The current state of the art, the NASA rover's spirit and opportunity, need instructions uploaded every morning to tell them what to do that day, but it's hoped that ExoMars will be able to function on its own for a much longer period of time. Like all space missions, Bridget needs to watch her weight. And to do that, she's on a strict diet. Each of the instruments will be carefully designed and strictly monitored to make sure that the entire science package weighs no more than a few tens of kilograms. Any more than that, and it just becomes too expensive to get them to the surface of Mars. That was the prototype in the quarry. We now await the real thing. And welcome now to someone deeply involved in it, 
Dr. Mark Sims of Leicester University. Welcome, Mark. First of all, can you say a bit about ExoMars in general? Uh, we're in the phase at the moment of looking at the design of the probe, looking at what instruments can fly. Hopefully there'll be a very big UK involvement. The UK's involved in many of the instruments and it will essentially build upon the legacy of the instruments which were built for Beagle 2. And of course on the legacy 2 of the existing Mars rovers. Of course, yes. Essentially the lessons learnt from the NASA rovers will be incorporated into Europe's rover. It will be a lot more sophisticated, we hope, in terms of autonomy, much more integrated instrument package and it will be the first mission to actually drill beneath the surface of Mars to actually obtain samples from one to two metres of depth. Has the landing site been selected yet? No, the landing site will be selected over the next few years um, as we get more data from missions like Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has this fantastic high resolution camera on it, which will take pictures at resolutions of sort of six to eight inches, 20 to 30 centimetres. And that will give us much more information in depth on potential landing sites. Well, you're deeply involved in this. Um, what is your major role, Mark? From a scientific point of view, I'm principal investigator on the Life Marker chip, which is an instrument which attempts to use biology to look for biology. We're using molecular receptors, uh, essentially molecules which will latch on to another molecule, very much like a lock in a key, to look for specific molecules uh, on Mars. And the right combination should actually point to life on the planet. We know now life is very durable. It exists in all kinds of strange places. Um, they've carried out experiments recently in the Atacama Desert. A recent discovery has been uh, microbes which live in salt crystals on the out outer yeah. surface of rocks. And just in the early morning, when there's enough water vapour in the atmosphere, the crystals absorb that water vapour, and then the bacteria actually live on that water, and they essentially live for a few minutes a day and then shut down to the following day. And that's sort of very reminiscent of perhaps conditions on Mars today, where we know we see frosts, we know we see ices overnight, and you can almost think of perhaps life existing on Mars using that model. I remember looking around the Atacama Desert when I was there, the weirdest place on earth I think. Nothing lives there except astronomers. Something like that, yes, and the odd bacteria. <laughs> well, at the end of its life, it will simply be left there. It will be a museum piece on the surface of Mars, hopefully for someday an astronaut to walk up and examine. We await results. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Patrick. Well, there are many other instruments on board ExoMars and Chris has been there to find out more about them and British involvement. This former power station in Oxford is filled with wind tunnels like these, which do everything from testing jet engines to simulating the surface of Mars. In this case, the wind tunnel has two jobs to do. First, it needs to replicate the thin Martian air, which means creating a pretty good laboratory vacuum. Once that's done, it can produce a steady wind to investigate Martian conditions and to test the instruments which will eventually sample the red planet's wind. So what do the sensors look like? Uh, well, we built a wind sensor for Beagle 2, and that looked like this. Um, and the way it works is it's a bit like uh, this old trick. The traditional exactly. sensor. Uh, and so what you're doing in that case is you're effectively measuring the heat transfer coefficient on, on various sides of a cylinder. And that's exactly what you're doing here. You've got a few hot films on different sides of a cylinder, and whichever one cools off fastest... Whichever side of the finger feels cold. Exactly. That's where the wind's likely to be coming from. And you, you can actually, by doing it cleverly, you can make it a quantitative measure, so you can actually get a speed and direction from it. So that was, that was um, Beagle 2. Uh, it's quite similar to what they did in the Mars landers of the 1970s. The Vikings. The Viking landers, yeah. Here we've got an old Viking lander, and here's the old uh, wind sensor for that. For ExoMars, the first thing we'd, we'd like to try is the same idea again, but make it even smaller. So this is the latest version, which is um, less than half a millimetre diameter. And extremely light, therefore. Extremely light, therefore we, we have the opportunity of putting several of them uh, on one lander, even though we've got less than half a kilogram for the entire meteorology suite. Most of what we know from the surface of Mars comes from the Viking landers. 
They gave us very good record of the surface pressure, which turns out to be about 100 to 200 times lower than that on Earth. It's a carbon dioxide atmosphere, so no oxygen to speak of, no water to speak of. And it's cold. The temperature goes down to about minus 100 degrees and then up to about 0 degrees centigrade. So 0 degrees centigrade is a warm, sunny day on Mars. A very, very warm, sunny day if you're lucky in summer. The wind speeds, are they Earth-like as well? The wind speeds are very Earth-like. In fact, most of the atmosphere on Mars is, is very Earth-like. The rotation rate of Mars is 24 point something hours, so almost exactly the same as the Earth, as is the axial tilt of Mars, almost exactly the same as the Earth. So the seasons are the same as the Earth. The atmosphere is largely transparent like the Earth, so the, the surface is warmed by the sun. That heat is then transferred to the atmosphere, and that's what drives the atmospheric circulation. So, for example, you get cyclones and anticyclones uh, traveling through the mid-latitudes as, as you do on Earth. And after Viking, it was nearly 20 years before the next rover landed, Pathfinder. What did that tell us about the atmosphere? Pathfinder did have a meteorological suite. It had, for the first time, temperature sensors at different heights. So we got an idea of the temperature profile near the surface, which was very useful and showed how desert-like it was. It also had a wind sensor, which returned wind direction, but not wind speed. So that's, again, a reason we're very interested in continuing these measurements. And then what about Spirit and Opportunity, which are up there now? Spirit and Opportunity don't have any wind measurements on them, partly because uh, there are always many, many teams who want to have an instrument on board, and this, this time the atmospheric guys just lost out. But it's a bit of a pity they don't, because the thing which really governs the lifetime of those rovers is the amount of power they can get from their solar cells. And usually, day to day, you get about 0.5% decrease every day due to dust deposition on your solar cells. But occasionally, we think, when a high wind event occurs, some of the dust is blown off and what happens then is you have a sudden increase in power. So they'd really like to know if their suspicion of high wind events is what is giving them more power. Dust storms, what do we know about them? Uh, well, obviously not enough is, is always the answer to every question. This is one of the questions we'd really like to find out, especially using wind sensors near the surface, because uh, dust is lifted from the surface. Uh, some of it's just because of the wind stress. Uh, wind comes along and picks up dust. But that doesn't seem to account for enough dust lifting. So another phenomenon which could be very important is dust devils, these sort of convective vortices. And they've been seen by the current rovers on Mars. Yes, yes, they've been seen. Uh, they estimate that at any one point, so at any one lander, for example, you probably see about two a day uh, which will come over this, uh, this lander. So we're very, very optimistic about seeing those. And yes, they've been studied as well. They've been imaged from orbit, showing... 20 of them in one frame. They must be big features if you can see them from orbit. Yeah, yeah. This, again, is, an, is a great reason for studying Earth compared to Mars because we can check our equations, our understanding of how they work on Earth and compare them to how they work on Mars and how we understand they should work on Mars. And the way the aerodynamic laws scale means that on Mars, a dust devil is, is much larger than it would be on Earth by a factor of 10 or more. So on, on Mars, these things can be 100 meters wide, a kilometer wide, and can stretch up several kilometers in the atmosphere. Here on Earth, we're protected from the effects of ultraviolet by the ozone layer. But on Mars, the amount of ultraviolet reaching the surface through the much thinner atmosphere is as yet unknown. And ultraviolet's important. It drives chemical reactions, and as anyone who's ever had sunburn can tell you, it damages biological systems. The Open University are leading the team developing the ultraviolet and visible spectrometer. We have here an ultraviolet spectrometer. So this is a device, you, you can buy it commercially, and it divides up the ultraviolet light that comes in at this end into its constituent colours. These, of course, are colours that we can't see. We're not, our eyes are not really sensitive to ultraviolet radiation. And it will produce different results on Mars than it would on the Earth, of course. It will indeed. We've got here on the screen a spectrum that we took earlier outside in sunlight at the surface of the Earth. And what we've got in this plot, it's a spectrum, so that's intensity on this scale against wavelength. We see the UVA band, as it's called. So this is essentially the colours of the ultraviolet spectrum, uh, but it cuts off at about 300 nanometers. So we don't get the really energetic radiation. That's right. And that energetic part of the spectrum is cut out by the Earth's atmosphere. But what happens on Mars? What we can do in this setup here is that we can shine ultraviolet radiation onto the spectrometer and we can simulate what we expect to see on the surface of Mars. This is the Martian spectrum superimposed over what we get on Earth. 
and the, the big difference is that we've got radiation in this band where we got nothing here on Earth. And that is the part of the UV spectrum that is damaging to biological systems, for example, to DNA. So any bacteria wandering along the surface of Mars is going to have a problem? Absolutely right. And so will astronauts, you know, when we send astronauts in the future to Mars. So why hasn't this been done before? The belief, uh, until fairly recently, probably because of the, the Viking measurements, was that the surface of Mars was sterile. Now that our ideas are changing, we realize that actually life might have, or even might exist on Mars, then the need to understand in detail the ultraviolet environment is much greater. And so that's why we've come up with this uh, experiment to do that. So what made us rethink our ideas about life on Mars? There now appears to be water everywhere. Okay, not liquid water as we know, but, but certainly ice. It might be possible that below the surface, actually if there's a local heat source, for example, that water might exist as a liquid. So, you know, that's one of the most important prerequisites. So that's one factor. The other are, are the so-called extremophiles that we find on Earth. These are, to use a non-technical term, bugs we find in the most extreme of environments, in extremely acidic, extremely alkaline conditions, in high radiation environments. In other words, we're realizing that life is much, much tougher than we'd ever realize. So perhaps Mars is not such an aggressive environment for life to have developed. And if it developed, what happened to it? Or is it still there now? Now, clearly, because of the ultraviolet, also the cosmic radiation, the surface is sterile. But is it not possible that life, if it existed in a simple form, might have evolved a mechanism to survive the changing environment? and gone below the surface. In fact, the models show that you don't have to go very far below the surface to be shielded from the UV and the cosmic rays. In fact, and this is one of the reasons why ExoMars aims to drill down below the surface for the first time. And while it's great to go to the Red Planet, sometimes, I can't resist mentioning, Mars comes to us. Indeed it does. I've actually got a little piece of Mars here. This is a Martian meteorite. How do we know that? Well, if you analyze the gas that's trapped in little pockets inside the meteorite, it's an absolutely perfect match for the atmospheric composition that was measured by Viking on the surface of Mars. So there can be no other interpretation. And presumably what happened is that we know that, like most bodies, the surface of Mars is subject to high-velocity impacts, so material gets thrown off, and it's perfectly possible for some of that material to reach the Earth and land as a meteorite. And in fact, this one landed in Egypt in 1911. And it's only been recently realized, perhaps in the last 20 years, that it was indeed from Mars. And you can so, see that it's traveled through the Earth's atmosphere, this black crust. Y yes, here. you can. It has a so-called fusion crust, this black surface layer, which results from melting as this sample entered the Earth's atmosphere at very high speed, and then it re-solidified and formed this so-called fusion crust, but below that the material is essentially unchanged by its high-speed entry. Well, it's incredible to think that we can stand here and hold a bit of Mars. We've looked at the atmosphere and at the planet's geology, but what lies beneath the Martian surface? And not just a few feet under the surface, but deep in the planet's core. To answer these questions, we need to use the science of seismology, the study of the way in which shock waves, from Mars quakes in this case, travel through the planet's interior. So we can't take the seismometer to Mars, but we have got a demonstration here. Yes. What we're doing here as the rover approaches us... Ominously is, in the background. <laughs> is, ...is picking up the vibrations that are being transmitted through the quarry and being picked up by the seismometer here, as you can see on the screen. And this demonstrates just one aspect of what we're able to do by sending a seismometer to Mars. This is looking at the very local structure, what the rover itself is moving over. And we wouldn't be able to see that by just looking. We need a seismometer to look at what we're traveling over. It's to do with the different speeds the vibrations travel through the soil. Yes, you're going to see a different signature as the rover moves over different material. Why are there three different traces on the screen? Well, we're going to be looking at three directions, both the vertical direction, an east-west and a north-south. But we're going to be looking at the full three-dimensional vibrations that are coming in. And this is quite important if we're looking at what's right 
underneath us, but it's even more important if we want to look at what's happening across the whole planet. Because these seismometers are going to be sensitive enough not just to pick up what's happening right next to me, yeah. <laughs> uh, which could be quite a large vibration, mm -hmm. but they're going to be sensitive enough to pick up a mass quake that may be happening quite a long way around the planet from maybe almost the other side of the planet. So it's quite a technological challenge. And on top of that, you can't take one of these to Mars. It's far too big. So how do you get around that problem? Yeah, first of all, we need to shrink down the spring mass system that we have inside the cylinder here to about this level here. It's obviously highly sensitive. I mean, it's vibrating just in your fingers there. What we've done to produce that sensitivity is we've carved this proof mass and this spring, the proof mass is in the middle, the spring's on either side, out of a single piece of pure silicon. And that enables us to couple in the smallest amount of energy that... A will, tiny shake. A tiny Mars quake, um, or a Mars quake that has traveled a tremendous distance through the uh, center of Mars, and we'll be able to pick up that vibration. And from that, we'll get our first glimpse into the internal structure of Mars. Now, I think people will know in the middle of the Earth we have a solid core, mostly iron, and then a liquid mantle, and then the crust that we're standing on. Is that going to be the same on Mars? We have only very, very vague models of what the internal structure of Mars is. And that's of great importance because that's the nearest planet to the Earth, and it would be very interesting to understand how another planet formed on whether the internal structure of Mars is similar to the internal structure of the Earth, or maybe very different. What would the differences be caused by? Well, we're looking at a planet which is formed at a different distance away from the Sun. It's formed from a different combination of primordial, of early matter within the solar system. So there are reasons to think that it could be quite different. I mean, if we're looking at the Moon, for instance, and Apollo used seismic data very much to look at the internal structure of the Moon, that gave us clues to the structure of the moon, that it had indeed had a, a, an early uh, a source that it shared with the Earth. We're still a little uncertain even now about the core structure of the moon, but we've looked deep inside the moon. And now it's time to do that for Mars. Yes, and this is going to be just the type of instrument on ExoMars that is going to allow us to do some geophysics on ExoMars. Of course, by looking at the internal structure of the planet, we're coming close to the question of whether Mars is a dead world or not. And it certainly was alive once. We see the giant volcanoes. Could you see any activity from them? If we're very close to a volcano, we will be able to pick up the volcanicity if there is any happening at that particular time. But they're all linked back to how much activity there is in the center of Mars. So if we see that we have a lot of seismic activity in Mars, that fits in with there being a lot of present volcanicity as well. So we're going to get clues about the volcanicity even if we don't actually detect a volcano erupting itself. The rover might be slow by human standards, but it is immensely strong. It could lift its own weight easily. To demonstrate that, let's see if I can manage to stop it moving backwards. A tug of war. Take it away. And it's off. And I don't think I'm making any difference at all. In fact, I'm going to be pulled forward slowly by the rover. Well, um, picture an astronomer being dragged across the Martian surface. I don't know. Well, it's all very exciting. And when I come back next month, we'll be talking about solar and lunar probes. Until then, good night. Tomorrow at 8.30, cooking in the danger zone, Stefan Gates travels to the South Pacific where people are literally eating themselves to death. Tonight, a double bill in our Visions of Rome season, starting with I, Claudius, next.